Columbia, British Columbia Camp 1984 to the 7th study presentation of the camp. And this is the 10 o'clock session on Sunday morning. Now we've been talking together about the Laodicean mission, what God plans to achieve through that. I want now to spend a few moments looking at the quality of person that the Laodicean message and the Philadelphia message will finally produce. And um, we need to have some concept of um, the perfection that God will bring out in his people before the end can be finally uh, brought about in the conquest of um, the beast in his image. I'll turn now first of all to the book of your writings, page 239, I think. Yes, page 239, early writings, and this paragraph describes the experience enjoyed by the people who were coming up to the great disappointment. This paragraph reads, A spirit of solemn and earnest prayer is everywhere felt by the saints. A spirit of prayer. In other words, they had it in them to pray. They desired to pray, and they spent much time in earnest supplications to God. Reading further, A holy solemnity was resting upon them. Angels were watching with the deepest interest the effect of the message and were elevating those who received it and drawing them from earthly things to obtain large supplies from salvation's fountain. God's people were then accepted of him. Jesus looked upon them with pleasure for his image was reflected in them. They made a full sacrifice, an entire consecration and expected to be changed to immortality. That is a description of a very dedicated and spiritually minded people, people who had risen to a very high level of excellence in their walk with God. Let's know some of the main descriptive sentences again. It says that angels were elevating those who received it and drawing them from earthly things to obtain large supplies from salvation's fountain. God's people were then accepted of him. Jesus looked upon them with pleasure for his image was reflected in them. They made a full sacrifice, an entire consecration. Now how would you like those words to be written of your experience at the moment? It would be very gratifying, wouldn't it? Very comforting, very assuring. And as those people faced the, ex the expected coming of Jesus Christ, October 20, 1844, they laid aside every earthly interest. They separated themselves from worldly goods and possessions. They spent much time in prayer and their entire thinking was devoted to the preparation for the coming Saviour. And consequently, of course, they enjoyed a very rich and very wonderful experience. Now, those people expected translation at that point of time, but Sister White says they were destined again to be sadly disappointed. That It says again because they'd already suffered the first disappointment. The time to which they looked expecting deliverance passed, they were still upon the earth and the effects of the curse were never seen more visible. They had placed their effects upon heaven and in sweet anticipation had tasted immortal deliverance but their hopes were not realised. Now I want to draw a diagram on the board this morning to illustrate um, the progressive development of perfection in the lives of those who will finally be taken to heaven without seeing death. Let's go back then to 1844 and the great disappointment and prior to that time Christ from the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary was working as a refiner and purifier of silver. That was his role. Um, I'd like to stress the point, especially in respect to the most holy place, it's a mistake to suppose that Christ's only work up there is to forgive sins that uh, Christ's ministry in the holy place involve <coughs> involves his transmitting light to his people and the same time affecting in them a very deep and thorough work of preparation. I turn there to Great Controversy, page 424, to develop this thought further, to demonstrate the ongoing work of, of character perfecting that Christ was engaged in from his place in the heavenly sanctuary. This chapter is called In the Holy of Holies and deals with the transfer from the first to the second apartment in 1844. It says, Christ had come not to the earth as the people expected, but as foreshadowed in the type to the most holy place of the temple of God in heaven. 
He is <coughs> represented by the prophet Daniel as coming at this time to the Ancient of Days. Quote from Daniel 7 verse 13 I saw in the night visions and behold one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came not to the earth as the pe- but, but to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. This coming is foretold also by the prophet Malachi. The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple even the messenger of the covenant whom he is a light in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Malachi 3 verse 1. The coming of the Lord to his temple was sudden, unexpected to his people. They were not looking for him there. They expected him to come to earth in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8. Now, why did not Jesus Christ translate his people at that point of time? They were not ready for it. The next sentence tells us that. But the people were not yet ready to meet their Lord. There was still a work of preparation to be accomplished for them. Light was to be given, directing their minds to the temple of God in heaven. And as they should by faith follow their high priest's administration, their new duties would be revealed another message of warning and instruction was to be given to the church. Now then, in other words, when Jesus Christ entered the most holy place, he entered there not just as an advocate, but, but he continued to occupy the role of a refiner and purifier of silver and gold. And that is, of course, in the most holy place. In other words, even though the description we've just read from early writings speaks of a, a group of people they attained to a very high level of Christian perfection, they were not yet ready for translation. They were ready to die and be raised from the resurrection, but not to be translated. Now, some people raise the question then, does this mean there's a difference between a person or, or two ways of salvation, one for those who die and are raised in the resurrection and one for those who do not die? No, there's not. The same plan of salvation, the same procedures for the one are needed by the other. But there is one difference. And the difference is this. Well, first of all, let's look at the similarity. The similarity is that both those who, are, who died and are raised again and those who are translated must have put away every known sin. The difference is that those who die have not come to know every sin in their lives, whereas those who, those who are living will have to be brought to the place they do recognize every sin in their lives. <clears throat> why then must some... Uh, why, how, how does God work this out? But it's simply as follows. When a person who is going to die because he's not, uh, not yet living near enough to the end of time, men like Luther, for instance, or Sister Wise herself, or William Miller, Wesley, uh, and the other great reformers, <coughs> and those who, those who stood with them, now, when they, during their lifetime, surrender every sin to God as fast as God reveals it to them, so they come to the end of their earthly race with no known sins unconfessed and, and, and unput away, and not put away, then God accepts their dedication, their consecration, as an assurance that if they live longer and saw more sins, they put those away too. So... Accept, accepting those the best that they can possibly do, when those folk die, then Jesus Christ makes a special atonement for them and removes their unknown sins from them to the sanctuary, so that they then are as if they had never sinned at all. But in the case of the living, this doesn't work. Now, A.T. Jones points out in, in The Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection, that before the sanctuary itself can be cleansed, the stream of sin flowing into it must be stopped at a source. And the source, of course, is the heart of the believer. Let's illustrate this in the following fashion. Here is the sanctuary with its two apartments, and down upon the surface, of course, is the believer. And as we sin and confess that sin, it is taken to the sanctuary and placed there in the holy place, even though Christ is ministering in the most holy place, is placed there pending his final disposition, which will be, of course, either back upon the sinner or onto the scapegoat, as the case may be. And so this stream is flowing into the sanctuary and must be stopped at its source in the heart of the believer. So this stream is cut off before the cleansing of the sanctuary itself can take place. And that's simple logic, of course. 
No um, person ever cleans up a bathroom, for instance, while folk are still due to take their baths. The mother waits until they've all finished, then she cleans up the bathroom. So first the cleansing of the people, then the cleansing of the sanctuary. And in the case of the person who dies, the moment he dies, the stream of sin stops flowing, because a dead man doesn't sin. And then that uh, means that God can take care of that person's particular problem and judge him and seal him and so on. But in the case of the living, when a person comes to the great day of final atonement, should he come there with every known sin confessed but with unknown sin still in him and pass into Jacob's trouble, the most uh, difficult and stressful and testing time of all, with unknown sin still in him, what will the trials and tribulations of the time of trouble bring out? It will bring out those sins. And then the person will have a problem. He'll have revealed sin now, which he can send nowhere. The sanctuary is closed. There's no more media, and there's no more a mediation in that sanctuary. There's no place to send that sin, so it must remain with him. And if it must remain with him, then he can't go to heaven because no person can take sin back to heaven with them. So therefore, in the very nature of the situation, those who come up to the great final day of test, the great uh, judgment of the living, the close of probation must of necessity be shown every sin in them, every unknown sin, so it becomes a known sin, so they can confess and put it all away before the great judgment day. And thus the living, while the, while the requirement is the same, the work must be carried to its ultimate conclusion. Now back in 1844, of course, the believers back there had many unknown sins. They were still observing Sunday, they were still eating pork and uh, all kinds of unhealthful foods. And they had very little idea of the many things which are, to us, common knowledge today. And therefore they were not fit to be translated at that point of time. Now, coming back to Great Controversy, page 44 and 5, we'll read a little further in regard to this procedure or this process. Now, when Christ left the holy place, from which great light had been shed, from there had come the light of the first and second angels' messages, he now entered the most holy place to shed even more light upon his people. As the statement says, light was to be given, directing their minds to the temple of God in heaven, and as they should by faith follow their high priest in his ministration there, new duties would be revealed. Another message of warning and instruction was to be given to the church. Says the prophets, quoting now from page 45 and also Malachi 3 verse 2 and 3 Who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth for he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver he shall purify the sons of Levi and purse them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness Malachi 3 verse 2 and 3 now note that this text is quoted in, in, in relationship to Jesus Christ's ministration in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And in that position he, he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So the work of cleansing achieved from the ministration of the first apartment is carried to a, to a higher standard to the ministration in the second department. Let's see how high the second department ministry will bring the people of God. I now read further. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless, their characters must be, be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed in the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin amongst God's people upon earth. This work is more clearly presented in the message of Revelation chapter 14. So then, during the period of Christ's ministry in the most holy place, there is to be a special work of purification of putting away sin amongst God's followers upon this earth. And as the light grows brighter and brighter, then more and more unknown sins become known sins and the work becomes progressively more complete. Now, 
when this work shall have been accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. Now when will this work be accomplished? At the close of probation. And when that time comes, God's folk will then be ready for his appearing, or in other words, ready for translation. So let's put the point here. Here is the close of probation. And at that point, the people of God will be ready for translation. And I wish to spend a moment or two now reading some statements to really verify that fact. First of all, to complete this one, page 45, Great Controversy. When this work shall have been accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old and, and as in former years. Malachi 3 verse 4. Then the church which our Lord at his coming is to receive to himself will be a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle of any such thing. Then she will look forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. Malachi I means Song of Solomon chapter 6 and verse 10. Now a little further over on page 428, I read these words in regard to the examination of the investigative judgment. It says, uh, after commenting on Matthew 22, which calls for the wedding garment to be on at the time of the judgment, the statement then says, this work of examination of character, of determining who are prepared for the kingdom of God, is that of the investigative judgment, the closing work in the sanctuary above. And note the words now, this work of determining who are prepared for the kingdom of God is that of the investigative judgment, the closing work in the sanctuary above. So the judgment determines, and of course the special reference is the judgment of the living, determines who have been made ready for the kingdom of God, not those to receive a further work of cleansing beyond that point. The last phase of the work from the most holy place is the loud cry, given in the power of the latter rain. And the latter rain is a mighty agency in perfecting within the people of God the character of Jesus Christ. On page 506 of Testaments to Ministers, this point is made very, very clearly. First of all, Sister White refers to the early rain and then the latter rain, and um, notes the fact that uh, while the early rain causes the seed to germinate, the latter rain brings that seed to perfection. And then Sister Wise says, The Lord employs these operations of nature to represent the work of the Holy Spirit. As the dew and the rain are given first to cause a seed to germinate and then to ripen the harvest, so the Holy Spirit is given to carry forward from one stage to another the process of spiritual growth. The ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character, we are to be wholly transformed into the likeness of Christ. The latter rain, ripening earth's harvest, represents the spiritual grace that prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. Now, <clears throat> the latter rain, as we know, is the final phase of the work from the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And the latter rain comes to its end by the close of probation. And here we, here we have just read that the latter rain prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, at the close of probation, God's people are then ready for translation. They have reached the level of excellence achieved by Enoch of old, who was translated from the surface without seeing death. And that is, of course, a very uh, high level of perfection to which to be brought and goes far beyond the level achieved by the believers back in 1844. And when we read, of course, what a spirit they had and what um, a spirit of prayer and, and earnest supplication and, and the acceptance of God, the reflection of Christ's image in them, and I suppose if we compare our present experience with theirs, we feel that we are behind, not ahead. So what must, the folk, what must we be like when we come to the close of probation? we see the full outpouring of the latter rain, we're given the loud cry, We've made an entire sacrifice. Christ's image is perfectly re reproduced in us. So what kind of minimum must we be at that point of time? 
and then then rise, raises the question then rises the question why then if we're fit for translation do we not at that point experience translation because we don't it's quite some time afterwards how long we don't know maybe maybe some days maybe who knows how long the old average teaching is one year but that certainly is not correct it's much less than one year the one thing is clear we then pass on through Jacob's trouble and the plagues begin to fall on their turn the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth and uh, the seventh and only then after all that the Jesus comes again and we finally experience translation now why is there then this delay and the answer uh, comes in the fact that, that a, a further work of perfection still must go on before we are finally ready for translation we turn to page 621 in the book Great Controversy to read this in very clear terms today 621 in um, Great Controversy a statement from the time of trouble dealing with the final um, purification which must be experienced by God's people that takes them to a level of perfection far beyond that experienced by those who come up to the close of probation they're the same people of course 621 great controversy reads as follows Jacob's history is also an assurance that God will not cast off those who have been deceived and tempted and betrayed into sin but who have returned unto him with true repentance while Satan seeks to destroy this class God will send his angels to comfort and protect them in a time of trouble or peril the assaults of Satan are fierce and determined his delusions are terrible but the Lord's eyes upon his people and his ear listens to their cries the affliction is great the flames of the furnace seem about to consume them but the refiner will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire so what role does Christ continue to occupy during this period the refiner the refiner will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire and of course Christ is the refiner still during the period of um, the latter rain as well <clears throat> so we have we have the very direct reference to Christ as the refiner during this period let me read the sentence again their affliction is great the flames of the furnace seem about to consume them but the refiner will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity but it is needful note that word needful it is needful for them to, to be placed in the furnace of, a of fire their earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected now um, sometimes we, we, we wonder Sister White says of course that um, back at the close of probation here the image of Christ is perfectly reflected in these people and it is but uh, that perfection can be even brighter and clearer as further cleansing processes are entered into so then very very plainly and clearly we're told that after we have become ready for translation and what, what a standard of excellence that will be another work of cleansing or refining a procedure or process goes forward to elevate God's people to a, to a much higher level of perfection than, than that which is required for translation that's made very clear in this particular statement and this period of their severest trial is one where the refining process of course comes much closer than it is during a less severe trial however during the period of the giving of the latter rain especially toward the end of it our trials will be extremely severe you won't be able to buy or sell you'll be hunted uh, placed in courts of law put in prison and so forth and so on and finally of course you'll face the actual death decree itself and if that isn't a severe trial an extremely severe trial then I don't want to have a severe trial but then beyond the severity of that during Jacob's trouble when the entire world is marshalled against the people of God this then will produce a pressure of persecution the like of which has never been experienced before by anyone but Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane and will never again throughout all eternity be experienced by any other of God's children 
This will be a finishing school in perfection. No other company will ever be privileged to, shall I say, enjoy. <laughs> Not quite the word, is it? <laughs> Privile endure, yes, endure would be privileged to, to, to go through. Now, this is why the 144,000 have an experience such as no other company have ever had, nor any other company ever will have. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 14 for a moment. Revelation chapter 14. And the first five verses, of course, describe the 144,000 and the experiences they go through. And we read in verse 3, And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the, and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000 which were redeemed from the earth. And in the great controversy, Sister White uh, has quite a long paragraph um, describing this particular um, verse or commenting upon this particular verse and makes it very, very clear, page 649, 648 and 649, that uh, the 1,000 do have an experience such as no other company uh, have ever had. Let me read these words this morning, page 648 to page 649. Upon the crystal sea before the throne, that sea of glass as it were mingled with fire, so resplendent is it with the glory of God, are gathered the company that, that have gotten the victory over the beast and, and, and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. With the Lamb upon Mount Zion, having the hearts of God, they stand. 140 and 4,000 that were redeemed from among men, and there is heard as the sound of many waters, and there's a sound of a great thunder, the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sing a new song before the throne, a song which no man can learn save the 140 and 4,000. It is a song of Moses and the Lamb, a song of deliverance. None but the one for the thousand can learn that song, for it is a song of their experience, and experiences as no other company have ever had, nor ever can have. Now to have that experience you must go through finishing school and um, in, order to, in order to qualify to enter the finishing school you must already have gone to the preparatory schools and the preparatory school is a ministry that is equivalent to the first department ministry then the ministry of cleansing during the final hours of probation you must have received the latter rain you must be qualified for translation before you can even enter that finishing school and obviously, of course, the set of circumstances which are brought together at this point of time are unique to that point of time. Never in the history of the past, nor ever again in the history of the future, will an opportunity like this again be afforded. I say an opportunity because while it's um, the grueling training we'll have to go through, the suffering we'll have to endure, is not very um, attractive and desirable, Yet the results of that finishing school will be very, very much to be de will be very much to be desired, because we'll emerge that with an experience such as no other company have ever had. And when you begin to appreciate what the one the cleansing the final cleansing process to which the one forty thousand shall pass, and the elevated level of excellence they shall achieve by the, by the time they come down to actual translation, one begins to recognise how. Foolish the arguments of some Adventist people in the past who claim that the 144,000 are made up of all those who have died since 1844 in the third angel's message. Now, I ask you very frankly, how could a person who died take even Sister Wise herself, how, how could she begin to have an experience to compare with what these folk will pass through? How could it be said that she or any other good Adventist had an experience that no other company had ever had? It just, uh, of course, is uh, quite illogical to say that. So then, in order to have this experience which no other person has ever had, one will have to go to the preparatory schools. We're in one right now. We'll have to graduate from this school to go to the latter rain and be brought to, to the level of perfection, suitable for translation. And having reached the point where Enoch and Elijah came, then beyond that, it is needful, Sister Wise says, for us to be placed in the furnace of reflection still further that um, we might achieve, we might be brought to a standard of perfection beyond that required for translation. Now, <clears throat> going back to page 621 again, 
And my purpose this morning, of course, is to show you the ultimate objectives of the Laodicean message, the third angel's message, the Philadelphian uh, experience and message. This is what God is aiming for and must achieve before the work can be finished. Now come back to page 621. It says, Their affliction is great. The flames of the furnace are about to consume them, but the refiner will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire. Now it's unfortunate that we have to learn by suffering. There are, there are easier ways of learning, isn't, isn't, aren't there? Much easier ways of learning, but not so effective apparently as suffering. 621, great controversy. So, um, during Jacob's trouble, we will pass through the most intense period of suffering that has ever been experienced by humanity. However, as I mentioned last year, and I remind you again, we can minimise the pain to a considerable degree as well as, of course, make our cases more secure. I turn back to page, or turn on to page 622, for instance, where I read these words, Those who exercise but little faith now are in the greatest danger of falling under the power of satanic delusions and the, and the decree to compel the conscience. And even if they endure the test, they'll be placed into, into deeper distress and anguish in the time of trouble because they've never made it a habit to trust in God. The lessons of faith which they have neglected, they will be forced to learn under a terrible pressure of discouragement. Now, we therefore today can make life a lot easier for ourselves and, uh, by being very diligent and earnest and, and uh, competent in learning the lessons of faith today. Now, this is always the same. For instance, if you go to school or the university and you, you, you neglect to make thorough work of your earlier classes and how do you find the later classes? Much more difficult if you pass them at all. Whereas if you make very thorough work of your lower level classes and when you get to the higher level classes it's not so difficult. And so those who exercise but little faith now are in the greatest danger of falling under the power, power of satanic delusions and of the critic compelled the conscience. And even if you do endure the test, if you do endure it, which is unlikely, you will be placed in a deeper distress and anguish in the time of trouble because you have never made it a habit to trust in God. The lessons of faith which they have neglected to learn, you will be forced to learn under a terrible pressure of discouragement. <clears throat> now why make things hard for yourself? Why not today be very diligent about learning lessons of faith so as to minimise or lessen the pain and suffering you'll have to pass through when the time of trouble comes. And then coming back to page 621 again, we have the assurance of course that God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity but it is needful for them to be placed in the face of fire. Now we want to ask why is it needful so we'll understand intelligently why this suffering has to be endured so we can cooperate with the heavenly refiner and lessen the time required to bring us to this level of perfection. And an intelligent, an, an intelligent understanding of what is coming, of course, is very important for God's folk. Now why then, do, why then A, are we not translated when we're ready for it? And B, why is this extremely close refining process ended into after we reached the level required for translation. Now we all remember of course the study of the seven angels. We know that the fifth, sixth and seventh angels do their work after probation's close. And um, that the work cannot be completed until such a revelation has been given by Christ through the one forty four thousand that the wicked come to see God's character as God's character is and seeing it withdraw their spirit of rebellion and no longer try to fight against the government of God. So um, we don't go to heaven when we reach the level of translation because there's a job still to be done and that job requires a level of perfection even greater than that required for translation. Let's now establish that principle from an experience in the life of Jesus Christ. I turn back to the chapter that, that deals with the cleansing of the temple. The chapter is called In His Temple. And uh, this is a very 
beautiful insight into the way in which God will bring about the final revelation of truth to those wicked people at the end of time. I turn to the Desire of Ages, page 157. Now we know the story, of course, of how Christ entered the building and saw in the courtyard the buyers and sellers arguing and debating over money matters and causing a tremendous din and uh, distractions to the worshippers within. Page 157, Christ saw that something must be done, in other words, Christ recognised that he was a problem which required a very definite solution. But uh, Christ did not, at that point of time, offer a solution to the problem. He left God to work that, that out for himself. And um, gathering up a scourge of small cords, he stands there and as he stands the attention of the people is attracted to him. The eyes of those engaged in their unholy traffic, passing across the page 158, are riveted upon his face. They cannot withdraw their gaze. They feel that this man reads their inmost thoughts and discovers their hidden motives. Some attempt to conceal their faces as if their evil deeds were written upon their countenances to be scanned by those searching eyes. The confusion is hushed, the sound of traffic and bargaining has ceased, the silence becomes painful. In just a few moments those men fled from that scene in abject terror. Now Sister White asked the question on page 162, and why did the priests flee from the temple? Why did they run? Why, why did they not stand their ground? He who commanded them to go as a carpenter's son, a poor Galilean without earthly rank or power, why did they not resist him? Why did they leave the gains to ill-acquired and flee at the command of one whose outward appearance was so humble? Very good questions. Now one thing is very clear of course, they were not terrified at the threat of physical force because one man against all of them didn't offer any real threat of that kind. They could very easily have overpowered him. He was one man, there were many and they were ruthless, cruel men who would have uh, used any weapon at hand to subdue Jesus Christ. Now then, here comes the answer. Page 162 in the book Desire of Ages. Christ spoke with the authority of the king, and in his appearance and in the tones of his voice, there was that which they had no power to resist. The, at the word of command, now note this text sentence very carefully, at the word of command they realised, as they had never realised before, their true position as hypocrites and robbers. When divinity flashed through humanity, not only did they see indignation on Christ's countenance, but realised the import of his words. They felt as if before the throne of the eternal judge with their sentence passed on them for time and for eternity. For a time they were convinced that Christ was a prophet and many believed him to be the Messiah. The Holy Spirit flashed into their minds the utterance of the prophets concerning Christ. Would they yield to this conviction? Repent, they would not. Now in other words, the Heavenly Father above, using Christ as his polished instrument, flashed a brilliant light through Jesus Christ that day which penetrated the darkness that surrounded those men <coughs> and gave to them a view of themselves which would otherwise not have been possible. And when they saw themselves as they were, note the words again, at the word of command they realised, as they had never realised before, their true position as hypocrites and robbers. They saw themselves as they were. Now, <clears throat> generally speaking of course, God can bring revelations to dedicated people who have a connection with him. And when people are sunken in iniquity and sin, God cannot reach them as a rule unless he has an instrument to which to shine the light. And Christ was that day his instrument. Now, the light was turned on for just a few, few short minutes and then turned off again. We know it was turned off again by the very simple fact that, that the very priests and rulers and officials who had fled from Christ's presence were able to come back within half an hour and stand in his presence again and actually argue with him which they couldn't do when the light flashed to them earlier. Now I've often wondered how God is going to finally bring to the wicked at the end of time down under the fifth and sixth plagues this um, illumination whereby they will recognize themselves for what they are apparently God must have at that time instruments of such polished perfection that he can beam to them the 
full flood tide power of his light to penetrate their darkness and bring to them a realization of God's character on the one hand and of the wickedness upon the other hand. Now, the, obviously, of course, the more sinful a person is, the, greater, the more powerful must be the light that shines in order to penetrate their darkness and sinfulness. And what can compare with the abandoned wickedness of the wicked down there beyond the close of probation? Having rejected the, ladder, the message of the loud cry, having in turn during, during Jacob's trouble fought against the work of God and the people of God, they will have come to the uttermost limits of wickedness and there never will have been a more wicked people upon the face of the earth and therefore a people so wicked that um, even instruments ready for translation are not sufficiently sharp, not sufficiently adequate for God to shine light through them to reach the darkened minds of those people. Hence, the need for a further cleansing work beyond the level, level for translation in the hearts of God's people to make them fit to be his instruments to do that final finishing work. And when we see the finishing work in this light, we begin to appreciate, or at least I hope we begin to appreciate, what a mighty work of preparation yet remains before we're finally qualified to bring about, or to be God's instruments to bring about the end of rebellion and the closing up of sin in the hearts of human beings in the world. So we need to recognize the scope of God's plans and then to enter more heartily into this work of preparation to recognize that preparation today is the only thing we should be concerned about the only thing all, all else is secondary to that so that our time for Bible study and prayer our searching of, of God's word should come first and other things uh, attended to uh, that must be attended to but only so far as essentials are concerned now when it says in Zechariah the third chapter that um, Joshua will represent men wondered at in the last days that we can begin to appreciate how those words will be true when the one for a thousand reach the stage of excellence which they shall achieve at the end of time. Now I do trust and pray that every one of us shall be amongst the illustrious company that will enjoy the opportunity to reach the highest levels of perfection that is possible for created beings and to go through the finishing school successfully and graduate in due time. My well, time is gone, so I'll stop at this point. Are there any questions you'd like to ask in these presentations so far? <coughs> Could you reiterate the, the, um, the analogy of prep school and finishing school? Well, it's self-evident because the preparatory school is now and the advanced preparatory school is the loud cry and the final finishing school is the period of Jacob's trouble and only those who have successfully finished the preparatory schools and have been brought to the level of uh, perfection uh, required for translation can enter the finishing school. The advanced, advanced preparatory school. And the finishing school is during Jacob's trouble and only those who have passed the previous schools and have reached the level of perfection fit for translation can enter the final finishing school. Alright then, no further, no 